to the Writer Talks. Thank you all for your tremendous support. The Writer Talks now has over 100 subscribers. I hope you continue to extend your encouragement and support, and I promise to bring to you some of the finest writers from across the world. It is also significant that this milestone has been reached on 23rd April, on William Shakespeare's birthday, and on World Book and Copyright Day, or the International Day of the Book. And in keeping with this year's theme to share a story, here's the story of my guest today, Stella Duffy. Stella Duffy is a stellar and spectacular writer, theater performer, cancer survivor, campaigner for LGBTQ, a feminist, trainee existential psychotherapist pursuing her doctoral studies at the age of 58. She is one who embodies zest for life and resilience. Stella lives in the UK along with her partner and she has spent her childhood years in the pristine climes of New Zealand. Her impressive body of work includes 17 novels, over 70 short stories, and plays that she has written, directed, and performed in. Stella has won the Crime Writers Association Short Story Dagger in 2002 and 2013, Stonewall Writer of the Year in 2008 and 2010, the Diva Literary Prize for Fiction in 2017. Her latest novel, Lullaby Beach, a contemporary fiction spanning three generations of women, has been published in February this year. Her novel, Money in the Mog, is a classic crime fiction that Stella completed in 2018, a novel that was originally started by the legendary Neo Marsh in the 1940s. Besides this astounding body of work, Stella is the co-founder of the Fun Palaces campaign for community-led culture and arts. She's a regular speaker and campaigner for LGBTQ, women's and arts equality and inclusion issues. She has been awarded the OBE, Order of the British Empire for Services in Arts, in 2016. This ace swimmer who loves to swim in the open ocean and the seas is now aiming to complete her doctoral studies. So let's dive in and without further ado, listen to this charismatic speaker speak about her latest novel, Women's Rights, and the campaigns that she is involved in, the many useful tips that she gives readers, besides lots of other things. Please continue to like, share, and subscribe to the Writer Talk so that we can continue such rewarding literary engagements with brilliant writers from across the world. Once again, a big thank you to all my subscribers. I hope you enjoy watching me speak to the spectacular Stella Duffy. Until next week, stay inspired, smile, and do what you believe in. Ahoy! Welcome to the Writer Talks. We have with us the amazing, astounding writer all the way from UK, Stella Duffy. And a warm welcome to you on the Writer Talks. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So delighted to see you in person, given the voluminous work that you have put out there. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, I am a 58-year-old woman. I sold my first book just before I turned 30. There has been quite a few years to do some work. You know, people I always find it weird when people say, oh, you're so prolific. I'm like, not really. Not when you think how long I've been doing it. So, yeah. Right, I, I heard that on one of your previous interviews, so I, I, I steered clear of using the word prolific. Well done, thank you so much. <laughs> right, let, let, let's begin by quickly diving into this uh, most recent experience and your newest experience that you are having. You're studying for your doctorate, that's, that's amazing, you're doing a doctorate and in existential philosophy. No, existential psychotherapy. So psychotherapy. it is the philosophy, but, but it's applied to um, psychotherapy. Okay. Awesome. So I'm in the second year now. I'm, so it's partly training to be a therapist, working with clients, which I'm doing, but also based on existential philosophical thinking. Right. So how did you, uh, what inspired you to do this? What inspired you to take up doctoral studies now? <laughs> uh, my second breast cancer at the age of 50. So um, I had cancer the first time when I was 36 and for the second time when I was 50. And I kept working uh, because I'm freelance. You know, I've never had a proper job. I've never been paid for somebody to have sick pay or holiday pay or, or compassionate leave. Um, and I kept working the way I always do. 
But it became pretty apparent to me quite quickly after my second cancer that I needed to change the way I was working, which was very much throwing myself into, into everything I did. And I do a lot of different things, as well as the writing as my theatre work. There's a lot of activism work. And I was just really, um, I think burning myself out is an odd phrase because I didn't feel like it. You know, I was still strong and still going. But I had five surgeries over an 18-month period. I kept going. I was very involved in a lot of political causes and a lot of um, theatre and writing work. And I just sort of came to the end of my tether. I, I just wasn't okay. And I, I was very fortunate. I was referred to do some work with an existential psychotherapist. And the core of existential work is really about paying attention to our choices. There's okay. nothing we can do about certain givens in our life. I, you know, I was born in 1963. There's nothing I can do about that. I was born the seventh in my family out of seven, you know, last of seven children. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, I'm gay. I, you know, I've been out as a queer woman for nearly 40 years. There's nothing I can do about that. They, these are all things that are real and true and they're my givens. But there are other things within those things that I have choices about. I can make different choices. And in making choices, we have to be responsible for our choices. So if those are the core thinkings around existential work, that the things that are given that we can't change, the places where we can make change and the places where we can make choice. And I decided to make a few different choices. I feel like I was running at my life at full tilt from the age of about five. And um, I think it was time to slow down a little. Not a lot. I mean, you know, I am doing a doctorate while still writing novels, while still working with other people as, the, as a creative mentor. So I'm not slowing down a huge amount. But I am making different choices that are more about what I want and what I truly care about rather than the things that I feel I might be obliged to do. So slightly different way of looking at my life. And and I've always worked with individuals and with groups um, in teaching writing and working in theatre and working one-to-one -one with clients and perhaps in the future working with some therapy groups i'm really excited about that that's fantastic I'm, that's so inspiring to listen to that uh, we'll continue talking about your writing and more about your work your process of writing and all of that but first up let's uh, dive into this first segment it's called yeah, the right. rapid response segment <laughs> okay. right so i'll be asking you a series of questions and uh, with choices so you will have to make a choice. That's that's a okay. given. But you cannot deliberate over them. You'll have to quickly respond to those questions. <laughs> okay. And briefly explain um, your choice. Okay. I'll do Great. my best. Okay. Yep. <laughs> All right. Here comes the first one. So which one would you choose between reading and writing? Wow. Uh, reading. There's so much more. There's so much more. There's... I could read for the rest of my life and be barely skim the amazing work there is to read. Um, and ideally reading and translation because I only speak English, unfortunately. So if all the books in all the world were available, I'd always choose reading. Right. I, I definitely agree with you on that. So between uh, plays, short stories and novels, which would you pick? Oh, uh, novels. I enjoy writing theatre. I really enjoy writing short stories. But there's so much more meat to a novel there's just more depth takes longer i can get lost more in it and i can screw it up more often as well but <laughs> um, yeah writing novels is my i love all the other things i've done a lot of the other things but writing novels is my my heart space right so in fact when i was reading up about you i, I really wanted to ask you this question because you have know, studied all, all, all yeah. yeah right and uh, okay considering that you're from the uk as well uh, apart from uh, new zealand so yeah. Lords, Mecca for cricket and Wimbledon, another <laughs> only great for tennis between Lords and Wimbledon. Which would you oh god, I, I can't I'm so I apologize to the entirety of the Indian subcontinent. I find cricket immensely boring. I'm really sorry. Oh. Uh, my dad was my Dad was a New Zealander, my mother was English. I grew up between both places, but I am afraid I have never found cricket in me. Um, it just doesn't do it for me. Uh, tennis, on the other hand, I really enjoy watching. That's lovely, <laughs> okay. Uh, now between the countryside and the coast, which would you choose? Oh, the coast, every time. I, I see no point in going somewhere unless you're going to the sea. The sea is my, it's my home, any sea will do. 
water is my home. It's not where I live, but it's my home. And and you're an avid swimmer, I read. Yeah, yeah, I love swimming, but I it's not. I don't like swimming in swimming pools. I don't like going backwards and forwards. I like being in the sea and being right. held. If I can't be in the sea, I'm happy to be in a lake. If I can't be in a lake, I'll be in a river. And if there's none of that, then I'll go to a swimming pool. It's lovely. <laughs> Fantastic. So between uh, Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Germaine Greer. Oh, my God. Wow. Great question. <laughs> um, because of my existential work, I think I'm going to have to choose Simone also, because of my, my work around deeper inclusion, I think that actually Simone's work may well have stood the test of time, even though Germaine's was probably more groundbreaking and made more difference at the time. Great. Fair enough. And uh, this, this one could be a clincher of sorts. Between New Zealand and England, <laughs> which of your choice is possible? Okay. Uh, all right. Oh, dear. So Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, Aotearoa is the Maori name for it, and uh, oh god, um, with apologies to the River Thames, it will have to be the Pacific Coast, specifically the Pacific Coast right. of the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's, that's a nice choice. <laughs> All right, I, I, I didn't. I didn't include uh, Justin Arden and uh, Boris Johnson. <laughs> that would have been an obvious choice. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's a very easy one. I don't think yeah. we need to make any choices about that one, do we? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for being such a sport. That's You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. But, uh, <laughs> right. I, I read that uh, you you are um, you're a founder and a co-director of the Fun Palaces campaign, and you also spoke at a newly founded political party called. Uh, Women's Equality Party. Let's let's begin yeah. by talking about that. Okay, so the Women's Equality Party isn't that new anymore. It was founded in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the original steering committee that helped set it up and the steering committee for the first 18 months of its life. Um, it's had uh, lots of small successes and gained a lot of attention in a very short amount of time. Basically, the point of the Women's Equality Party is exactly what it says. We have never yet achieved equality for women. Um, not in Britain, not anywhere. Um, there are so many parts of culture, of community, of business, of family life, where women are still both doing the bulk of the work, but also not being attended to, not being paid for, not being supported to, and not being um, judged equal let alone when we bring in the appalling stuff about violence against women, um, the, how dangerous it still is for just young women, old women, all women to be on the street, um, how dangerous it is for disabled women, how things are, you know, a, a woman who is blind is so many more times more likely to be sexually assaulted than a woman who is not blind, um, than, and also than a man who is blind. So, so what we've got is there's all these intersections of um, problems and difficulties. And one of the things that I find most exciting about Women's Equality Party work is it's the first party in Britain to be led by a woman of colour. Um, Mandy Reid is amazing. She's really thoughtful and smart and clever. Um, it is intentionally inclusive and intersectional at its heart, um, knowing that we cannot just talk about feminism unless we also talk about ableism, unless we also talk about racism, unless we also talk about classism, that these things all belong together and they crisscross each other. And so there's no point in just having yet another white feminist organisation that only cares about, I don't know, helping women get into boardrooms whatever you know there's been so much of feminism that is only about how can we help women behave more like capitalist middle-class white men and that doesn't change the world whereas the work of the women's equality party has been since its inception to try it's hard right we haven't yet done any of this anywhere we've never fully achieved it but to try and genuinely make equality for all women and therefore for all men and therefore for all people who identify as non-binary because it's not just about the old binaries of men and women it's about all of the people so that's the women's equality party and then fun palaces because fun palaces started in 2013 women's equality party in 2014 and launched in 2015 um or 2015 yeah 2015 um 
Fun Palace is, is based on an idea from the 1960s. The theatre director, Joe Littlewood, and the architect, Cedric Price, um, in Britain, wanted to create one building that would house all the arts, all the sciences. It would be accessible and free to anyone who wanted to go, and it was going to be in a part of the East End of London that got very bombed in the Second World War, that was still extremely poor, that had had no um, investment in its infrastructure in a really long time, and that the people really needed support. And of course, it didn't happen. Um, it didn't happen because it was an idea far, uh, far ahead of its time. But it also didn't happen because it was, it, well, it was very expensive. Cedric Price, the architect, was trying to make a space that could be all things to all people and to build a building. And he actually believed that you should pull buildings down after 10 years because by then they will have fulfilled their function. And then you go and build another one. And in 1965, it was going to cost £5 million. And in 1975, it was going to cost £15 million. So that's why it didn't happen. Far too expensive. Fast forward to 2013, when I personally, as someone who loved Joan Littlewood's work, as one of the few very successful British women theatre directors, wanted to do something to acknowledge her centenary on the 6th of October 2014. And I just, at an event with a lot of other theatre people, called a session saying, what shall we do? And that meeting took 45 minutes and changed my life. Um, and out of that 45-minute meeting, we decided, well, we could make fun palaces now, here, where we are. We don't need a building. We've got a lot of buildings, and this isn't just Britain. I mean, you will know places that where, you know, they're used in the daytime, but they're empty at night. Why are they not open at night? I don't know for people who are homeless who need somewhere to sleep, for a young theatre company who needs somewhere to rehearse. Why are we not enabling a little space in every place where the cleaners are so that they could have in their half-hour break while they're having some lunch, they will also might have a quiet and clean space to write why are we not sharing all of our physical spaces more generously so rather than build a fun palace we said let's just use the spaces we've got and the other key about fun palaces is instead of it being run by someone like me someone in the arts someone who has led organizations before though I hadn't at the time so I was also someone brand new to running things um I should be led by anybody because in a community, there are always, any community, you don't need to have you know, a degree in running social organisations. Who's the woman or the auntie or the uncle that everyone goes, oh, they know, they know how to organise a party? Or they'll know how to organise the group of us who want to go uh, to the river together for a picnic. That person... That person is always the best person in any community to run a fun palace. They know who to ask for help. They know who's going to put on a song. They know who's going to make a lovely lunch. They know who's going to turn up and help put up the tables and chairs. They know who's going to turn up and then run away when there's any work to do. Every community has amazing people. And I, when I say aunties and uncles, they might be the older people who we're often leaving out. They might also be the 15-year-old that no one ever asks, would you like to create something? So with fun palaces, we're looking intergenerationally, um, into community to say every community is capable of running and creating its own community cultural events. And by doing so, by using arts and sciences and all forms of arts, all forms of sciences, little experiments, just trying stuff out, get the nine-year-old who's good at science at school to teach the 59-year-old who left school at 14 and doesn't know anything about science, right? So that we're not always leaving it to one specific group to lead and we can trust that everyone is capable of leading in their community. I thought that was a one-off. I thought we were going to do a one-off in 2014 and that will be it. And what happened was 138 places around Britain joined in. To date... It's something like 1,600 communities around Britain, but also in Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, uh, Portugal, Aotearoa, New Zealand, of course, because of some people I know, Australia, America, Canada. No one in India yet, but we welcome you. I, I, I was about um, to ask. <laughs> um, we had one in uh, Cambodia, in Greece, in Athens, a refugee community uh, with a local comic library ran their fun palace. So, I mean, often and having fun palace run by the refugee community rather than for the refugee community is what makes a difference. So the refugee community is perfectly capable of creating for themselves. They, you know, what they've been through means that they know so much more about how to survive, how to get on, how to keep going. So they're the best people to teach and to lead rather than always assuming it's people like me you know people have written a bunch of books or 
I find it weird whenever I go to book festivals and people talk to writers like they know things. I don't know. Go ask, go ask the person who delivers the post. I think they probably know things too, you know. Anyway, it's been going for eight years now. I only left in January. I stopped being the co-director as well as the co-facilitator in January in order to concentrate more on my psychotherapy work. Um, and it's been amazing. I have met so many phenomenal people all over the world, but also all across Britain. And it was a dream that we thought, my co-director Sarah Jane Rawlings and I, might last for a few years. And now we're in people's diaries as Fun Palaces Weekend. <laughs> and it happens the first weekend of October. And the organisation just supports people, not with money, because otherwise we'd have to choose who we said yes to and who we said no to. But with publicity, with posters, with one-to-one um, -one mentoring support, with workshops, so that it supports people to do what they want in their community, trusting that the people always know best. Sounds very exciting, and I look forward to having one in India then. <laughs> that would be great. We'll buy Fun Palaces. We don't have time. <laughs> well, actually, the, the reason it's called Fun Palace is because Joan Littlewood believed that learning can be fun. Right. And the reason it's called Palace is not to name it after something like Buckingham Palace, but it's named after the people's palaces, the music halls, where the people would get up and do a turn, where they felt like it was theirs. So it was about reclaiming space from those who were in charge and sharing it with everybody. Right. Since we're talking about leadership and heading organizations, heading events, heading committees, do you think women make better leaders than men? Well, given that you nearly asked me about Jacinda Ardern and Boris Johnson, um, I don't think it's a women-men thing, except that that's how it shows up. Right. So men are taught to take control. From the time of being a little boy, they are taught to lead, to step up, to do, but to do by themselves. Right. Maybe to do with one or two friends that they, that they trust, maybe to do with a family member that they trust. Yeah. Women, because we have generally been told to just get on with doing everything else but don't step up and lead, we know how to run a kitchen, run a family, uh, look after. I mean, my mum was, you know, had seven children. Um, that meant that my big sister knew how to look after everybody. Of course she did. There were seven kids. My brother. I have one brother and five sisters, so there's six girls, one boy. My brother knew how to look after himself. He's a lovely, lovely person, and I love my brother very much. But he's very good at being in charge. He's less skilled at working everyone together. So what ends up happening is that, is that generally, if we follow the traditional paradigm of power, and the traditional paradigm of power has been male, it ends up being one person in charge telling others what to do. If we follow a nurturing community-led paradigm, which has ended up being female because women have been relegated to the back, relegated to the kitchen, relegated to the back garden, then we end up with a more cohesive and interconnected paradigm of power. That's not necessarily male or female. It's just what we've done to boys and girls and then to men and women. So when people looked at Margaret Thatcher and they said, oh, she just behaved like a man, I think she behaved in a male paradigm of power. Okay. So if our belief of power is that it's one person telling other people what to do and having ultimate responsibility, then sure, it's going to look male. Whereas if our belief in power is we can all talk together, we can all work together and we can share, then it's going to look female because of what we're used to doing. That's well put, yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And congratulations on the new latest novel, Lullaby Beach. Thank Again, you. it's been so well received and I and I thank love you. reading the book. Uh, thank you oh, so thank much you. for sharing that with me. Stay right there. I'm gonna go over here and grab a copy of it so you can look at the cover. Absolutely, absolutely. Because it's such a beautiful cover. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, it's just so gorgeous. I love I love it when I get a nice cover. We don't I, I love the orange dress she's wearing. I know, me too. So I thought I'd wear something orangey red to match, you see. <laughs> okay. Oh, that explains it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, it's a contemporary fiction and, and I know it must be humongously challenging because you've covered three distinct time periods. Yeah. Now, which was the time period that was easiest to write about? Nineteen fifties or in more recent times? Um, so it's set in the 1950s, 1990s, and now. And it was far easier to write about the 1950s. Um, I, partly because I just, 
I've really enjoyed the character of Kitty, and she is the one character that stays all through all three time periods. Okay. Um, and it kind of is Kitty's novel, even though it's set in three time frames. Um, I just every now and then it doesn't happen with every novel, but every now and then a character bubbles up out of me, out of people I know, out of experiences. And they're just a joy to write. So my Theodora novels that are set in um, 548 uh, um, Christian era in Istanbul, in um, uh, oh, so sort of before, yeah, Constantinople before, just at the edge of it becoming um, Byzantium. Um, and uh, I loved writing Theodora. She was just delicious. Um, and that was my first um, historical writing. So writing Kitty was a similar kind of joy. And it goes from her, from the age of 17 up to her 80s. And she's a, a strong-willed, but also very vulnerable, kind, and also brassy. She's got a lot of polarities going, a lot of paradoxes. And I find that really interesting. Um, and she wants desperately to be loved and she doesn't know how to be. And therefore, of course, gets herself in really difficult positions with the, the man she starts seeing, Danny. Um, but also my, my mum, as I said, I'm the youngest of seven children. And in the 1950s, my mum and dad lived in a shared house with a lot of other families and it was a very similar to the house that kitty and danny live in london where they had so kitty and danny have one room and a shared bathroom um and like a little gas ring to cook on and my mum and dad had two rooms but five children and a baby and the baby slept in the drawer um because lots of babies slept in the drawers in the 1950s and you know london post-war so much had been bombed there weren't many places unless you had money there just really weren't many places to stay and my parents certainly didn't have money um and what i know about that time i wasn't born yet but what i know from my siblings from my mother's stories is that that house mattered a lot and that the, the landlady mattered a lot and the support of the landlady mattered and so i wanted to write that kind of house and so you get Kitty and her friend Ernestine, who was first generation Windrush, just come over from Jamaica. You know, Britain had said, come, come, we want you. And then she arrived and she was black and they really didn't want her. Um, and she was she's dealing with, with the experience of racism in, in Britain in the 1950s, which was deeply painful, um, compared to Kitty dealing with the experience of being a young woman in the 1950s, trying to, to grow her life. And for Kitty, it's the sexism. For Ernestine, it's the racism. But they're, they're in parallel because they both exist really strongly. And for Ernestine as a black woman, yes, of course, the world's sexist, but she's used to that. She's a woman. Coming from Jamaica, she hadn't experienced this kind of racism before, particularly as she'd been, you know, they were told they were welcome here. Um, and because there's been a lot of repercussions from that in Britain in the past sort of five years, I really wanted to acknowledge that these people my wife's family are from Kolkata and they moved to London in 1959 she was born no 1961 my wife was born in Kolkata and her, her older sister was born there and her mother didn't you know was was there from the age of um well she was born there until she was 20 came to London for a bit went back met my father-in-law and um that experience of being an insider outsider you know officially part of the British empire called british my you know my mother-in-law is very certain that she's british but some of the racist people in england today would not call her british you know and so there's that <laughs> there's that experience of being officially welcome not really welcome inside outside and for kitty that experience is shown not in race or racism but in in love out of love in in trusting that she's with danny and then in him hurting her and I think all of us have places where we understand what it's like to be inside outside. And that I think can help us be empathetic to others. Um, I have a, I have a, a, an idea that if, if we were to work with our own individual racisms as a white woman brought up in a racist society, it's where I understand what it's like to be an outsider is where I'm most able to understand what it is like for my friends who are black or Asian or struggling in Britain for, for race and ethnicity reasons. Where I understand what it's like to be inside is where I least understand it for them. Sure. So I think paying attention to those places for me as a writer is so interesting for characters because it means that your reader 
who is also an inside-outside person. All of us have places where we feel we belong and places where we don't. When you pay attention to that as a writer, it makes a massive difference for the reader because the reader begins to dream in to some parts and then other parts, they go, oh, that's, that's nothing like me. But those are really useful. It's lovely. Yeah, and and you, you're right, you, one needs to be empathetic in, in order to be able to understand, grasp those, those, those yeah. kind of oddities and those kind of uh, yeah. trials and tribulations, so to say. Fair enough. Yeah. I know it's unfair, but if you were to pick a character, your favorite character from the novel, would it, would it be Kitty? I, I, I have a feeling. Yeah, that I, think, I, mean, I think it would be Kitty, although Ernestine is a lovely character. And because she stays alive, I mean, it's not giving anything away to say that Kitty dies in the second chapter, although the book is a lot about her. Um, Ernestine gets to give a lovely reflection of what's going on. I also think that... Um, the this, this sibling relationship between Beth and Sarah as sisters, I'm really proud of writing that. Sibling relationships can be hard to write because, because we're trying to, as a writer, we're trying to get the, the speech rhythms and the dialogue rhythms of people. And actually siblings often talk quite similar. We often have similar views, not the same, but similar views. And so trying to differentiate between siblings as a writer can be quite difficult. So I had to work really hard on that. And I'm pleased that I ended up coming up with two characters that do, of course, have the crossovers that any siblings would, but also have their really strong differences to make them show up on the page. Right. Now that you have the book by you, uh, would you please read your favourite section from the book? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, I'll try and keep this short. Uh, this is this is this is when we first properly see Kitty, and her parents own a boarding house, a seaside boarding house, and so she's used to there being loads of guests in summer and it being very quiet over winter and it's cold at the seaside. But she's also changed. She's changed in the past year. She's grown up. Her body's changed. She's becoming a woman, not a girl, and it's and she's feeling it very strongly. Westmere, nineteen fifty six. Kitty Barker sidled into the dining room to take the breakfast orders. It was the first day of a new week, and she liked to get a good look at the guests first thing. These days, she preferred to have them glance. She, these days, she preferred to have a glance over them before they saw her. She changed a lot in the past year. She was taller for a start, and her bust had filled out. She knew her figure looked good and was fine with it being noticed by the fellow she fancied herself. But a few of the dads this season had made a point of insisting on a cuddle or a kiss to welcome them back. It was getting embarrassing, and their wives looked daggers at her too, as if it was her fault their old man couldn't keep his eyes or his hands to himself. She stood by the sideboard, listening to the new guests, their excited exclamations filled with a week's worth of hope. Those seagulls don't have to make a racket. The music for the merry-go-round on the pier is lovely, isn't it? I was just dosing off and caught a bit of it on the wind. <laughs> The breezes were so strong last night. I do you like a proper seaside or bustle? It's how you know you're on holiday, isn't it? That and the kids screaming blue murder for another stick of rock. And they would laugh and dip a triangle of bread and marge into a runny yolk, crunch a crisp rind of bacon, pour another cup of milky tea and plan days of pebbles and sand and candy floss, slow afternoons and long nights. And Kitty would wish herself anywhere but Westmere. Preferably London. Uptown downtown she knew all about soho frothy coffee and cocktails with sweet cherries smart lads on scooters with girls who jumped on the back and rode off with good-looking boys hair flying up behind cheek nestled into the back of his neck aftershave and brill cream and change danny nelson was change on a stick for the whole of summer of 1956 when pat boone and doris day were vying for the attention of all clean-cut kids Danny Nelson spent his Sundays remodelling the old hut right at the end of the bay. Eventually, Westmere View's guest house would offer Lullaby Beach as the perfect getaway for honeymooning couples and anyone for whom the noise of the pier in the front was just too much. Kitty was drawn by Danny's dirty blonde hair and his knowing smile. She was drawn by how it felt to have him look at her. Kitty knew she looked good. Those annoying guest house dads made it only too obvious. She was tall, with long, shapely legs, dark haired, her eyes ringed with long, dark lashes. Jane Russell to Marilyn Monroe. As it turned out, Danny Nelson preferred brunettes. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. So, Thank so you. brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I think your reading brought it out all the more. <laughs> uh, I think readings <laughs> do help, yeah, they really do.
<laughs> right. And, and I, I'm not surprised given your theater back, background. <laughs> well, actually, what I, say, what I say to new writers, though, is rehearse your readings. You know, what I just read, I didn't read everything that was on the page. Because when you do a reading out loud, you need to skip some of the bits that work really well on the page and actually work better in, in the reader's head than they do when they're spoken out loud. I skip to moments of action. Sometimes it's all internal monologue. There's another bit that reads quite well, which is a bit from Kitty's funeral, actually. But new writers just want to read every word. <laughs> and then they read for 10 minutes, and then it's too long, and it's boring. Whereas what you want to give the, the, an audience is a little bit that makes them go, oh, I want to go and read more, rather than make them feel satisfied so they don't have to read the book. That's a very valuable tip. I, I remember that. <laughs> I mean, it's really, and also I, I tell people to rehearse it, you know, so you know you've got a three-minute section, a five-minute section, ten minutes is always too long. I don't care how good the book is, ten minutes is always too long. Too long. You know, keep it short, keep them hungry. True. Now, now, what about writing? When you're writing, when you have a story with you, are you thinking of your readers? Are you thinking of a particular target audience or... Because you have the story and you're impelled to write, you go ahead and write it. Yeah, I'm, I am unfortunately quite rubbish at thinking of a target audience, um, much to my publisher's despair. I'm not capable of um, writing another book that was as good as the last book and exactly the same, just with a few titles changed. I can't do it. I have, I know some, you know, some people are massively successful at doing a similar type of book book after book after book and as a reader I really enjoy that and and it's a special skill it really is to make a, a similar style right. brand new even though it follows a format you know crime you know really successful crime fiction for example you know that in the end something is going to be worked out but how you get there anyway I can't do that I, all I can do is write the next story that that fills my heart and gets my guts going and it's those things that make me want to tell it. So it really depends on the story. So with this one, I think I was aware a little of who might be the reader, but not very clear, not, not at least until about the fourth or fifth draft. And I do a lot of rewriting. Um, and I think, I think also because I'm now in my late 50s, it, it's really important to me that I try and write for a wide audience. I think in my 30s, I pretty much assumed all readers were in their 30s <laughs> now I know better um so there are characters in their 50s and their 80s and their 30s and their teens in this book and I hope therefore that the book would have some interest for people of lots of different ages rather than only writing for for me and women like me interesting. yeah that's 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 another very interesting insight now now what uh, what inspired you to write uh, Lullaby Beach um so Lullaby Beach has the story of three different generations of the same family and three generations of women affected by sexual abuse, domestic violence, and, and sort of the big spectrum of it, from coercive control that never looks violent and never even involves a gentle, playful tap, but is so damaging to the person who is under the thumb of the other one who is coercively controlling them, right down to actual extreme physical violence. Um, and also it, it echoes a lot of the work of the Me Too movement. I think the Me Too movement has made a massive difference and been of value, but most of the publicity it's had has been around famous people, certainly in Britain, certainly in America. Um, and in fact, even you know, the Bollywood stories that have come out, it's yeah. still been more about the famous people. Sure. And of course this happens in every element of society, not just to celebrities and not just to people with money. And if you don't have money, it's a damn sight harder to lift yourself out of it. Um, and so I really wanted to look at what it's like for ordinary women. How is it for ordinary women when we are faced day in, day out with sexual the things that go from sexual harassment on the street, which as Kitty in the 1950s quite liked being whistled at. She's not saying she hated it, but how it showed up in her life later was in quite extreme sexual violence. And I wanted to look at the spectrums of that. But I also wanted to look at it through the lens of several generations and how it's changed over time. And also how some women have always been complicit with this. So we can't just say, oh, it's just men. Men do that. It's how men behave. How often do you hear a mother say, my son would never behave like that? Oh, yes. you know, how often do we hear that? And yet, of course, 
They are all some mother's sons, those men who behave like that. How often do we hear people say, oh, I, I, women say, I've, that would never happen to me. And it's like, I don't know. I can't say that. I can't say that what happens to a friend or a sister wouldn't also happen to me. I can't say I'm so strong, so special that I could withstand it. So I wanted to write about families with really different characters and show that how this sort of thing, in all its multiplicity, can happen to lots of different types of women. And also to write about violence and abuse and how that's cyclic as well, because the two men who are the perpetrators in this book are uncle and nephew. And, and you know, there are a lot of studies and a lot of understanding that if we grow up in violence, if we perceive abuse to be ordinary or acceptable in some way, we will become perpetrators unless we find a way to stop that in ourselves. So the cycles of perpetrators, the cycles of victims, the cycles of people then taking it out on other people, that stuff really interests me. And I wanted to write about aunts and nieces. Um, I have uh, 15 nieces and nephews and 31 great nieces and nephews. And that, that, that diagonal relationship of aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, that doesn't come up very often. And I really wanted to write about that. That, that's that's a very interesting angle. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. We have to talk about this uh, really, really interesting uh, crime fiction that you have written. I think it's called uh, Money in the Mog. I, I, I still okay. think about the title. Did, did you think yeah, of Money in the Mog? Title? So, um, no, I didn't think of the title. The t- so, Naya Marsh, Dame Naya Marsh, she was a right. um, crime fiction writer from the Golden Age. She was a contemporary of Agatha Christie, of Marjorie Allingham, Dorothy L. Sayers, and at the time in the 19, between the 1930s and the 1950s, more successful than any of them. Um, I think she was placed alongside uh, Agatha Christie and... Uh, oh, absolutely. And the, she was one of the four queens of crime, totally. Um, and uh, she was also a New Zealander and a theatre director. And in 2014, or maybe 2015, remember I've already said I was doing a lot already in those years, quite a lot, and yet HarperCollins um, came to me and they said that they had, um, had, they'd had had for about 20 years about 5,000 words of a novel that um, Naya Mush started writing during the Second World War. She didn't die until the 1980s and she kept publishing right up until she died. But she'd written about 5,000 words of this novel but never finished it. And the assumption was that she didn't finish it because it was set during the Second World War and the war ended and she just wanted to forget about the war. Perfectly understandable. And they said, you know, you grew up in New Zealand, you're a theatre director and you've written crime fiction. Of of my 17 novels, about uh, seven crime novels, I think. Six or seven. Um, Six or seven, yeah. And, um, And they said, did I want to finish it? And it's so different than, so my crime fiction, very contemporary, um, never a who done it, always a why done it, much more interested in why people do bad things than, than who does the bad thing. Um, and they said, did I want to finish this? And I was like, oh, God, no, that's going to be far too hard. It's a terrible idea. Um, there are huge fans of Naya Marsh. She knows so much more about her work than I ever, ever will. And yet... If they were going to ask anyone and they were looking for a theatre director who was also a New Zealander, who also wrote wrote crime fiction, I'm the only one, and also lived in and loved London, as she did, I'm the only one I know among all the British crime writers and all the New Zealand crime writers. So I think I was kind of perfect for it. So I had a bit of a panic and I thought about it and I talked to my colleagues in Fun Palaces and I talked to my wife and... It actually just felt like too good an offer to say no to. Ah. Also because Naya Marsh's fiction is very theatrical. Great. Uh, old, old style theatrical, very old fashioned. Um, but really strong in that. She's great at writing ensembles. She's great at writing, you know, a leading man, a leading lady, a sidekick. And really fall and writes a wonderful free act play structure. So I went away, I worked out where this was set, which was just after her first 10 novels. I think she's written 32, yes. So I didn't, so I worked really hard. So even though I'd read them years ago, I 
only reread the first 10, so I didn't accidentally put something in that happened at novel number 16 or 17. And all of those people who know far more about them than I do would say, I'm afraid Roderick Allen never said that until 1982. Um, and they'd be right and I'd be wrong. So I made sure that I knew the first 10 really well. And then I created a very traditional third act, three act, theatre structure for the book, came up with an ensemble based on the characters she introduced in these 500 words that she wrote. Um, and the Habakons were lovely. They said, you know, um, she hadn't left a note to say who the murderer was, why they did it, none of that. Um, so uh, I, I went away and made it up. Um, and so Money in the Morgue is what came out of it. It's her title, it's some of them are her characters, lots of them are my characters. But the way they come together is mine. The setting is hers. She was really good at location and setting. And this is on the plains in New Zealand um, and, and South Island. And so, yeah, that, that's that's how that novel came came about. I was I loved writing it. It was definitely well, you know, out of my normal um, comfort zone. But it was really good fun. That's that's fantastic. What, were you at any point in time apprehensive or? Uh, did you find it challenging considering you the whole time terrified absolutely <laughs> terrified um, i uh i went i was in new zealand for some other work and i went to visit naya marsh's house in christchurch i met a lot of people who'd worked with her um they were just keen really you see unlike agatha christie who had children and her grandchildren have really helped promote her estate naya marsh didn't have children she didn't marry she um didn't have a partner that we know of um, although there are lots of rumours about who were her partners. Um, but we, there was no partner she ever personally spoke about in public very strongly. And so she didn't have a family left to push her work. So more than anything, I wanted to do justice to her, to her work and to her name. And the whole point was really to draw people back to her writing. If they wanted to compare it to mine and if they found mine lacking, fine. You know, go read, go read The Master, The Mistress. <laughs> right. Um, now, from the entire body of work that you have written, uh, including your plays, <laughs> I mean, there are lots. I, I, I know, again, it's, it's, it's hard to pick and it's, a, it's an unfair question, so to say. Who would your favorite character be? Who would you identify yourself most with? Oh, oh well, my favorite character and who I'd identify myself with, they're not the same. So... Um, my first three novels were crime novels, and a lot of people identified me with Saz Martin, who is the private eye in those. I've never identified me with Saz. Um, I know who I identify Saz with, but I'm not telling anybody even now after all this time. Um, I know that I do have, from the outside, what people perceive to be the spirit of someone like Kitty or Theodora or says an outgoing, strong, determined personality. But I also know that like lots of people who are outgoing and strong and determined, I'm vulnerable and shy and scared and I get an, and as lacking bravery as anyone else. Um, so just because I'm really good at turning on my extrovert self doesn't mean that I don't really know my introvert self. So I think that I also very much identify with some of the the smaller, the quieter characters I've written. So in um, London Lies Beneath, which is one of my favourite novels of my own, which is based on a true story um, that happened in 1912, uh, a bunch of sea scouts drowned off the coast of the Thames. And this was, you know, 1912, before the First World War, and a million people lined the route of these boys um, uh, you know, following their coffins to their funeral. It was a massive event. And, of course, only two years later, all so many more young boys died at the Somme. They died, you know, on both sides of the appalling Great War. Yeah. So there are characters in that that are, that are definitely quieter and sort of more sitting back and watching. There's, um, there's an aunt who lives over the road. I can't even remember her name now because it was a while since I wrote London Nice Beneath. But she looks out through through the window. And she looks out and she she looks to see things. And I think there's part of me that that watches and takes stuff in, and then maybe turns them into stories later. So I think quite a few of my books might have a watcher somewhere in the background. In many ways, I probably personally more identify with the watcher 
than I do with the, the one that's more like this. But obviously, I can't do an interview with you if I'm being a watcher. I have right. to turn on. I have to turn on performance stellar. Sure. And performance stellar is very useful as a performance. Anyone is very useful as a character. So in Theodora, that that character is so interesting, and so useful. In London Lies Beneath, one of the kids is much more like much more outgoing. Um, and outgoing characters are very useful for getting the plot and keeping the plot driving. The Watcher characters are really useful to help the reader catch their breath, to help the reader work out what else is going on that maybe isn't being spelled out as much. That's brilliant. That, and it's um, so interesting. You're fascinating as you put it across. <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm going to next pick up London Lies Beneath. So I, I, oh, I, I didn't know that is your favorite novel. Well, yes, I mean, I think singling out the couples is a is a really exciting, it's a magical realism novel of mine. I think it's really exciting um, and quite dark. Um, so it doesn't have happy endings. Um, I think uh, State of Happiness, which that is the cover of, um, uh, that my wife bought me that for a present after that came out. Um, uh, it was when books book covers were done by proper artists not that the visual artists aren't proper but actual hand painted so i got oh. to keep that which is cool um and you know now they're all done by design and, and in fact i mean you know this stunning right. piece of work but you don't get to get the photo in the same way you could get to keep the painting right. yes. um and so state of happiness i think is is definitely one of my favorite books of mine and those characters are very different actually to to others but yeah london lies beneath is special for me because i do despite the fact that i said i'd live by the pacific coast in in aotearoa new zealand i do love living in london and i was born in london and i've lived back here as an adult since i was 23 and the river thames is so important and this book is very much about london it's set in 1912 it's about pre first world war london London, just as people are beginning to understand, mm. you know, the working class are beginning to understand they could do a bit more and the women are beginning to consider being suffragettes, you know, and, and there's a whole lot of rising up and I really like that. Right, yeah, and what fascinating times those were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of fascinating, we, we have to speak about uh, Theodora. I, I, I really loved what I read of that yeah. uh, from the net and actress Empress Hor. It is a it's a historical, right? And it chronicles the story of Theodora. Yeah, so there's there's two novels. There's Theodora, Actress Empress Hall, and there's The Purple Shroud. So the first novel is Theodora from her childhood up until she becomes the Empress. Mm. Um, Empress of Rome. Either the last Empress of Rome or the first Empress of the ba Byzantine. It depends which historian you listen to. Um, yeah. And then the Purple Shroud is when she is the Empress. And Theodora was amazing. I mean, the, the historical story about her is written by Procopius, who wrote The Secret History, not Donatart's Secret History, the first Secret History. Um, and he hated her. And so what you get is this picture of this evil, conniving Lady Macbeth kind of character. But we know that we can't trust Procopius because he also wrote that Justinian wandered, Justinian was the emperor, her husband, that he wandered the palace with his chopped off head underneath his arm. So we can't trust what Procopius right. thought about Theodora. Um, and the story about Theodora that I knew was the story that I heard when I was at a book festival in Ravenna in Italy. And that's when we, there's these amazing mosaics um, and uh, they're huge. And on one side, uh, uh, is um, yeah, there's a mosaic of Jesus in the middle, and over here there's a mosaic of the emperor and all of his courtiers. Really unusually, exactly the same size. Here is a mosaic of Theodora, the empress, and all of her courtiers. The women are not less important than the men, and that made me go, "Wow, that's amazing!" And also, she's a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church, and I was like, well, "What? Who could this person be?" And so I started doing some research, and I came up with the basic story, which is that she was born in a family that worked in the Hippodrome. Her father was the bear keeper for the bear fights in the Hippodrome. Um, she became a whore, uh, a dancer, and being a dancer meant that you were prostituted, not of her own choice, by the way, but of course by the men, but Procopius doesn't write it like that. He writes that she just chose it. Of course she did at the age of eight. Um, and what we know is that her father died, um, and we don't know how. And so what I decided to write, of course, was that he died, he was killed by a bear. And so she and her sisters had to go to work. Um, 
but she, when she became the empress, she brought in the first divorce laws that gave women back their dowry. This is in, this is in 530, 5, 528. Hmm. The first laws that gave women back dowries when they were divorced by their husbands. She brought in anti-rape laws. I mean, she was amazing. So you have to, so what that made me think was, well, working backwards, we don't know much about her childhood, but what must she have been through for this to matter? What must she understand? For this to matter, because other people might become empress and just think, oh, fine, I'll, I'll just lie down and eat grapes. She worked to make a difference. So I think it was really important to me going from the few facts we had to work backwards into what could have been her childhood. We also know that she had a big religious conversion um, and that that was really important to her at the time. And there was people living out in the desert um, in North, Northern Africa who were, you know, very early Christians trying to work out what Christianity could be before the church decided it was this and only this. Mm-hmm. So I think she's very interesting. There's this faith, there's passion, there's love. You know, Justinian, who could have and probably should have married after she died, lived for another 20, 25 years. He never married again. So I think it's I think it's really important to consider their relationship. So it's a love story, it's a rags to riches story, and it's a feminist story. And it's a, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, I, I was so taken in, and uh, I, I mean, I have to share this. I, I found this on Amazon, and it says uh, Theodora is an extraordinary, imaginative achievement from one of our finest writers. That's, 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 that's lovely. <laughs> People don't always say nice things, but when they do, I try and remember. Like any writer, I am more likely to remember the bad reviews than the good ones. You can have 20 good ones and one bad one, but all the writers remember the bad ones. So I'm glad you're <laughs> quoting the things. <laughs> no, that's that's very important. So much so that I, I, I didn't know much about Theodora, frankly speaking, and I but this, this impelled me to go and look it up. And, oh, no, no, she's so amazing. Yeah, that's, that's lovely. fantastic. Now uh, let's let's move to your uh, and yeah by the way this this also won the uh, Stonewall Writer of the Year in 2010 uh-huh. won yep. the Stonewall Writer of the Year award right let's move on to your short stories and uh, Martha Grace obviously we, we we have to mention that it it won the short story Dagger in 2002 yep. right so um. How did you come about the story? The most most obvious. Well, yeah, I was working on this anthology with Lauren Henderson, and we wanted to write a, to create an anthology to edit an anthology that was um, that had uh, women writers, but writing women who hadn't written crime, doing some crime writing, women who hadn't written uh, passion, sex, maybe doing some sex writing, not erotica, more like. Sex, passion, no, not, not the gentle, gentle, softly, softly. And so we called this anthology Tart Noir, and we then both also had to write a story for it. And, of course, when you're editing an anthology, what you're spending all your time doing is just desperately trying to get the writers to send you the story they promised they would send. Um, and then we had to write our own stories for it. So I knew that I have been slim, I have been fatter, I have, I am short. I'm only five foot two. Um, I have cared about my body image. I have not cared about my body image. I wanted to write about a woman who just loved being a big woman. She believed in her own sex, her own passion, her own sensuality. And she meets and falls in love with a young man and he treats her badly. Um, I can't really say any more than that without giving yeah, it away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can't give it away. <laughs> In fact, I, I, I actually froze when I read the ending. Yeah, it's, oh, a, gosh. it's a passionate love story that is also very dark. And it comes out of her living in a culture in which it is inappropriate for a woman to be anything other than a size 10 in which it is inappropriate for a woman to think that her curves are sensual and delicious and in which a woman decides to get revenge because of that right. interesting yeah that, that, that's uh and uh moving to theater now you, you you're also a performer and you've had in your solo shows you you've written 10 plays right and which includes an adaptation of media and I found this title very interesting, The Tedious Predictability of Falling in Love. It's part of your uh, solo show as well. 
was my first solo show. I've done three solo shows. Um, yeah, that was a, that was a very long time ago. It must have been in something like 1988, 89. It was my first solo show, and it's a conversation between Stella, me, and God, and God talks in rhyming couplets. Um, and oh, yeah, it's, about, it's about the tedious predictability of falling in love. In fact, the title came from a friend of mine that I was working with as a performer in an um, improvising theatre company. And um, she'd just fallen in love again. And she'd had several very unsuccessful relationships. And she just went, oh, the tedious predictability of falling in love. And I went, I'll have that. Great title. So, yeah. <laughs> it is. It is a great title. <laughs> right. Now, um, which... Um what are the kind of switches that you actually have to make when you're writing a play or as opposed to a short story or as opposed to a novel? Um, I think not a lot, really. I mean, I think the writer's real job is to get the hell out of the way and stop making it about ourselves. We can't not because we can only write of ourselves. We can only write about things that we know or feel we know or guess we know. Right. I don't mean that it's our actual incidents of our life, but like I was talking about empathy earlier, we can only write things we can imagine. We couldn't write it otherwise. But once we've done that, once we've done a first draft and it's all poured out, I think the job of the writer is to get out of the way and try and make it as best as possible for the reader, for the audience. So I went into directing from writing theatre because it's all very well to write a great play, but it doesn't work unless it works for the audience. And that's the same with, with writing novels, short stories, whatever. It's all very well to write beautifully. If that doesn't translate somehow to the reader, there's no point. So there is a lot of beautiful writing <laughs> that has never seen the light of day of mine because it, it's not relevant for the story. It's not relevant for the novel. It doesn't matter. I, it's only there because I think it's lovely. It has to work for the reader. It has to work for the whole. And you can get away with writing beautifully, um, excessively in poetry, because every line should be beautiful. You can almost get away with it in short stories if the short story is very short. If you're trying to write beautifully in every single line in a novel, I would say take a good long look at yourself and ask who you're doing it for. Really, I would. Because every now and then the reader needs a break. They need to be able to skim over a paragraph just to be able to jump back in. And you are doing your writing a disservice if every single word has to be the most beautiful, most complex, most delicious, most, most lovely. Sometimes the reader just wants simplicity. I mean, that's why Raymond Carver's short stories are so amazing. It's why Catherine Mansfield's short stories are so amazing. Sometimes the simplicity is what takes the work, getting our clever selves out of the way, our beautiful selves, and just be plain, just be simple. That will carry us such a long way, and then you can come back and give them another lovely line. Um, so for me, it, it, the biggest work always comes. So I, I improvise my first drafts always. The biggest work always comes in the second, third, tenth draft. And in that, I am working very hard to make it not about me and make it about the story. Fair enough. Who, who has been your most trusted uh, critic and editor? Is it one person or there is more? No, not really. All of my editors have been great. I mean, I've worked with one, two, about five different editors over the years. They've all been great. Um, my wife and I no longer show each other. She's a writer as well, a playwright and a radio writer. We don't show each other our work until it's done. Uh, that was that was not a good idea. Um, I know some writing couples always show each other their work. I, I prefer to have a good relationship with my wife than to get her to be my editor. That's, that's not great. Okay, okay. And uh, what, what, what do you think has been the best compliment so far? Something that has stayed with you, something that resonates with you? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I really don't. I, when people say that they read a book again, I'm always really moved. I'm like, wow, you gave me all that time and now you're doing it again. That's so kind of you. Um, when people say they've read a book three or four times, it's like, wow, <laughs> oh, I, don't think it's, I, don't, I don't think it's that good. I love that you do. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm always really moved when people read, read me more than once. I think it's so generous. I mean, you know, as I said right at the start, there's so much to read. If someone would spend that time with me again, that's so kind. It's lovely. Uh, what what, what uh, impelled you to write in the first place? I mean, I mean as a child, did you always want yeah, to I just I, I, I like stories. I like sharing stories with people. Um, I, as I said, I'm the youngest of seven, so 
getting my voice heard was hard. I had to push to be heard, and I think <laughs> that that probably impelled me. Um, I think I like I like to be understood, and I think all of us hate to be misunderstood. And for me, sometimes telling stories is a different way of being understood. Fair enough. What, what is a typical writing day for you? I don't have any because I, I, I think seriously, in all this time, 14 plays, more than 70 short stories and 17 novels, I have once had two weeks where I was a writer, once. Um, I don't know why people think they have to take six months off and go to Tuscany to write a novel. They really don't. That's absurd. Um, I have always written around other work. I have written around directing theatre. I have written around my fun palaces work. I'm now writing around my psychotherapy doctorate training. Um, you know, the writers who I love have always done it around other stuff. They fitted it in rather than treating it like it's, it's not that I don't take it seriously. I take it very seriously. I just don't take myself that seriously. I don't think I'm so special. I think I'm really lucky. I think, I think it's weird when writers think they're special. We're just really lucky, you know. So, so to, to then say, oh, well, I'm so special, I have to have 12 hours of complete silence and my family mustn't come near me. Well, get over yourself. You know, my, my mum and dad both left school at 14. They had to leave school at 14. They, they both worked their entire lives. My dad died at 67. He was a labourer most of his life. But, you know, that's hard work. What I do is great, and I'm, and I'm really bloody lucky to be able to do it, that people pay me some money for it, that they're willing to buy my books. It's great good fortune. So I fit my work in around other things I'm passionate about, whether that's activism or theatre work or other work, and that, that seems to work. Who are your favourite writers? Mm -hmm. Probably too many to name, really, and not fair. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do it. Not doing it. Oh, but I, will, I will. I will say two New Zealand writers that perhaps your your viewers wouldn't know about. So, um, Janet Frame, who they might know about from her autobiography Angel at My Table, is also a beautiful fiction writer, mm -hmm. and I think probably a better fiction writer. And I don't think many people know Janet Frame's um, work as a fiction writer as well as they know her biographies. And there's also an amazing, um, really important Māori writer, Patricia Grace. She's an older woman now, as in she's older than me, and I'm an older woman now. Um, and I don't think her work is anywhere near well well known enough outside Aotearoa, New Zealand. She's a stunning writer. Um, and if people wanted to read something that wasn't just set in New Zealand, they thought that they would um, understand a bit more her novel too. T U um, is set during the Second World War and it's also set in Italy. Uh, it's a it's a phenomenally good novel, but it's also a lovely introduction to her work. Interesting. All right. Any special message to viewers of the Writer Talks? Oh no, thank you. Just thank you for giving me your time. And for thank you, Asha, for for doing this and for for taking. I think it's really um, generous of you to create time for writers to speak about our work. It's something we love, and so your work in making this possible is really lovely. Thank you. That's that's very kind of you, and I completely I find it a very rewarding experience. Thank you for for your time. You're welcome. Thanks so much and uh, take care. What's what's coming up next? What are you currently working on? What's coming up um, next? Well, I'm working on my doctorate. <laughs> um, and my thesis is about women and menopause and understanding menopause as part of the spectrum of womanhood uh, mm -hmm. rather than an end or, or a medical symptom. You know, it's just okay. part of who we are. Um, I do have another novel that I've sort of started and I'm sort of doing some work on and a couple of essays. Other than that, <laughs> Other than that, I'm free. <laughs> oh, wow. Other than that, you're free. All right. I, I look forward to having your great talks back very soon. Thanks a lot. All the best. Okay. Bye bye. Thank nice you. to meet you. Bye bye. Thank you.